that you take anything that would hinder us from gleaning from the word, your word, Lord, that you have put in pastor's heart to present to us this morning, that it would be taken from us, that we would learn and draw closer to you, that we would worship you in spirit and truth, and that we can cry out, Abba, Father. And we thank you. We thank you so much for all that you do, for we know that all good things come from above. And Father, we thank you that we are your children. Thank you for this holy and tremendous blessing. Help us to be conformed each day to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and ask these things. And all your children said, Amen. 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 Well, we have some announcements. This Wednesday, there will be no VBS and no Wednesday night Bible study. It is a week for the church camp out, and many of us will be out at Leo Carrillo State Beach. So, uh, for this Wednesday, there will be no Bible study, no VBS. But please... That's a vacation for you also, but only a one-week vacation. We'll be back, we hope, hopefully stronger, the following week. Amen. Also, ladies, no Tuesday night prayer meeting this Tuesday. Once again, it will resume the following week at 6 p.m. on Zoom. That is the following Tuesday. And tonight there will be, tonight and next Sunday night, there will be no Sunday night Bible study. So those of you who are looking to tune in, to participate, uh, it'll be back in three weeks. But we hope that some of you, God will put in your heart to, to join us. Robert does a really good job of uh, explaining the Word of God. With that, that is the extent of our announcements. Have a blessed day, Pastor. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Praise the Lord. All right. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6 this morning. This morning we are going to begin looking into the greatest sermon ever preached. The Sermon on the Mount. It is a startling sermon. Kind of shocking. Paradoxical. Hard to understand and even harder to accept. It's the greatest sermon ever preached. Now, Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 49, deal with it. Matthew deals with the same sermon in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Luke gives us an abbreviated form of the sermon, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Matthew takes three chapters to deal with it, and Luke takes about 25 verses. So we're going to look at the short form in Luke. The title of the message is Kingdom Living. And if you didn't receive an outline, you can just raise your hand and we'll get that to you. You guys all got an outline? All right, excellent. Kingdom Living. We are citizens of another kingdom. We have been transferred from this kingdom to that kingdom. We're going to look at four things from these verses. Entrance into the kingdom. We'll start with that. How do you get into the kingdom of God? Now that is a critical question 
and you got to get the right answer. How do you get into the kingdom of God? How do you get into heaven? Very important question. In Luke chapter 6 verse 20. And turning his gaze toward his disciples. He began to say. Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Now don't misunderstand that verse. That is not extolling physical poverty. Because we know in the Bible there were a lot of very wealthy men. Job, Abraham, Solomon, just to think of three. What kind of poverty is it speaking about here? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Well, Matthew... Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 adds a little bit more to that idea and helps us understand what it means to be poor. Let me just read that. Matthew 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's the key. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who have spiritual poverty, who are bankrupt and destitute and have absolutely no spiritual resources to obtain God's favor. Blessed are you who acknowledge your spiritual bankruptcy, deficiency, Poverty, you've got nothing in your hands to commend you to God. You're poor. You're poor. In comparison to the Pharisees, they were not poor in spirit because they believed that they were spiritually elite, they were spiritually wealthy. They believed that they were going to get into heaven. They were going to obtain entrance into the kingdom of God because they were spiritually all together. And Matthew tells us in chapter 5, verse 20. Let me just read that for you. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees were spiritually wealthy in their own minds. But blessed are the poor in spirit. Those that say, Lord, I have nothing to, I have nothing to contribute to my salvation. I'm bankrupt. I'm poverty stricken and I know it. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Then it goes on in chapter 6 of Luke, verse 21. Blessed are you who Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Are you hungry? So yeah, I haven't had breakfast. Is that what it's talking about? No, no it's talking about, well, what, is, what does Matthew say? Matthew 5, verse 6. It qualifies what this hunger is. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So what kind of hunger are we talking about? We're talking about deep hunger and longing for acceptance by God. It's speaking about a starving beggar 
longing for righteousness, hungering for acceptance by God. You're hungering. So not only are you poor, but you're hungry. You want righteousness. Kind of like what the psalmist is speaking about in Psalm 42. Psalm 42. Verse 1. Psalm 42 verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks. So my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And then it goes on. My soul thirsts and hungers for God. I'm like a deer that is hungry. Thirsty, panting, searching for the living God. And then it says the same thing in Psalm 63, verse 1. O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Lord, I'm hungering for you. I'm thirsting for you. I'm longing for you. Blessed are the hungry, for they shall be satisfied. Are you hungry for God? Do you acknowledge your poverty of spirit? And are you hungry for the things of God. And then Luke brings out a third. Now this is how you get. This is entrance into the kingdom of God. Without these you cannot get in. You've got to acknowledge your poverty. You've got to hunger. And then it says in verse 21 of Luke 6. Blessed are you who hunger now. For you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now. For you will laugh. Weep. It's speaking about an emotional breakdown. Once you recognize your spiritual bankruptcy, you weep. You weep. You grieve. Once you realize your destitute state, you weep at your condition. You look at yourself and you weep. Because you know how far you are from God. Those that weep, they will laugh. They will rejoice. God will wipe away your tears and will give you laughter. Laughing, joy, relief. But you first of all got to weep. You got to acknowledge your spiritual poverty and feel bad about it. You are alienated from God. And until you acknowledge your poverty, and until you hunger for God, and until you weep, you can't get into heaven. You can't get into the kingdom. James chapter 4 brings out this idea of weeping. James 4 verse 9. James 4 verse 9. Be miserable. And mourn. And weep. Why? Why should you be miserable? Why should you mourn and weep? Because you acknowledge your spiritual poverty. Because you acknowledge your alienation from God. Because you acknowledge your condition. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. Why are you laughing? There's nothing funny about this. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. He will exalt you. You want to be exalted? You've got to first of all weep. 
So Luke, in speaking about the kingdom of God, first of all, lays out entrance into the kingdom. How do you enter the kingdom of God? And you first of all, acknowledge your spiritual what? Poverty. What? Poverty. Poverty. Spiritually. And then you hunger for God's righteousness. And then you weep over your condition. That's how you get into the kingdom. Now, are you willing to pay the price of getting into the kingdom of God? There's a price. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. There is a price to be paid for entering the kingdom of God. And some of you have already experienced this. You know what this is speaking about. <clears throat> Luke 6, 22. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Wow, this is a hard-hitting sermon. You're supposed to leap for joy. When's the last time you leaped? Most of us don't jump a whole lot anymore. We have a hard time tying our shoes. Matter of fact, it takes so much effort. Once you're down there, you figure some other things to do while you're there. <laughs> but to leap for joy when you are persecuted, when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you, <clears throat> the price for joining the kingdom of God is persecution if you're not willing to pay the price then you're not willing to join the kingdom or enter the kingdom read the Bible all kinds of verses about persecution let's start with Matthew Matthew 10 you will be persecuted not by strangers because most of them don't even know you're a Christian. Who knows, that, who knows you're a Christian? Your family. Your friends. They'll probably no longer be your friends. But Matthew 10, here's the reality of joining the kingdom of God. Verse 33, But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. And here's the test. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So... The price for entering the kingdom of God is persecution. And many times it comes from your own family. And you want to love, you want to have a close relationship with your family. And that's why this kind of persecution is the hardest. 
This is the hardest to bear. And there are many Christians that give up the battle and say, okay, I, I give in. I'm giving in to my kids because I want a relationship with them so badly. And I know this Christianity Sunday stuff is just putting a wedge between us. I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to backslide. I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to leave God. And I'm going to go with my kids. And you know you've experienced that temptation. You've experienced that temptation. My kids want to party, they want to drink, and they want me to be a part of it, but I can't because I'm a, a member of First Fundamental Bible Church. You know what? I made my choice. I'm leaving this life. I'm going there. A lot of, a lot of Christians make that choice. My husband, doesn't want to, my husband doesn't want to serve God anymore, or my wife doesn't want to come to church anymore, so now I've got a choice to make. If I keep coming, then I'm at odds with him or her so I, I'll just take the easy road cut this loose and go with my spouse that is backslidden that happens a lot too that happens a lot too more than you want to know <clears throat> more than you're willing to know the price for joining the kingdom is persecution and hardship. Hardship. How do you handle persecution? Look at Acts chapter 5. This is how you handle it. Acts 5 verse 40. Acts 5 40. This is how you got to handle it. Acts 5 Verse 40, they took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And they kept right on preaching, but they rejoiced. Thank you, Lord, for considering me worthy to suffer for you. Oh, there's a price. There's a price for joining the kingdom of God. Count the cost. Count the cost. But there is a danger for not entering the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 6. We're still on the sermon. Sermon on the Mount, Luke 6, 24. There's a danger. 6, 24. Luke. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed, for you shall be, mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Three times the word woe is used. What does woe mean? It's a divine pronouncement of judgment. God is pronouncing judgment. You don't want to be part of the kingdom of God. Okay. Woe to you. You are under the wrath of Almighty God and someday you'll stand before Him and He'll say, Depart from me. I never knew you. He'll send you to hell where you'll never ever come out. Hell is eternal life without the possibility of parole. And you never die there. So it's not even the death penalty. It's eternal. Woe to you. Three times. Three woes. The danger of not entering the kingdom of God. What keeps you out of the kingdom? Well, here's some things right here. Verse 24. Woe to you who are rich. For you're receiving your comfort in full. Enjoy your riches. It's all you got. Enjoy it. 
Buy all you can. Enjoy it because this is all you get. What keeps you out of the kingdom of God? Wealth and money. Money is a great tool, but most people can't handle it. Most people, when they get a lot of it, it starts to consume them. They can't deal with it. It starts to own them. And instead of treating money as a tool, they start submitting to it. King Mammon. Wealth keeps people out of the kingdom of God. Because when you have a lot of wealth and money, you think, I don't need anything. I'm good. Well, it must be great being you. Just remember, money can't buy you peace and it can't buy you time. The wealthiest men in the world all die too. They get diseases and they die. And all their wealth cannot help them. Can't help them. Here's an instructive passage where in Luke, look at Luke 12. That's why God doesn't allow most people to have a lot of wealth. You can't, you can't handle it. See, I think I could. No, you, you wouldn't definitely, wouldn't, you wouldn't be in church. You wouldn't be here right now. <clears throat> How do I know that? Because even when you get a little bit of money, it gets to your head. People can't deal with it. They just start thinking that they're all that. Luke 12, verse 15. Then he said to them, Beware, be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive, he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, You have many goods laid up for many years. Come, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You fool! You fool. Wealth keeps many people out of the kingdom of God. And when you think about it, it's tragic because you can't take any of it with you. Like these two nephews speaking about their wealthy uncle. What did he leave when he died? What did he leave? He left everything. He left it all. You can't take it with you. <clears throat> can't take it with you. Okay, so wealth. And then back in Luke 6, 25, here's another thing. Woe to you who are wealth. Let's see. Um, woe to you who are rich. You're receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed. You shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now. For you shall mourn and weep. Laugh. Laughter. What is it speaking about? It's speaking about the silly lifestyle. Frivolous, shallow merriment. Life is one big party that never ends. Party, 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 laugh, 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 never considering eternity. Laughter, partying, taking drugs and alcohol, womanizing. Or manizing goes both ways. Just one big life is just one big party. 
And then it's all over. Then it's all over. Your heart stops. Laughter. Life is not one big party. I mean, it's nice to have fun in this life, but when you think about it, you've got to take it seriously because this life determines where you're going to spend eternity in the next life. You make the wrong choice in this short life, you will pay the consequences for eternity in the next life. So you really have to be sober. You can't just be frivolously parting your life away. You've got to have some sobriety. Think it all through. Laughter. Laughter. And then in verse 26. Woe, woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. When everybody speaks well of you. You may have a problem. Especially if you're a Christian. You're a Christian and everybody at work really likes you. There's, there's, a, there's a problem there. Because when you're a really outspoken Christian, people are not going to like you. They might like you to your face, but they'll talk about you behind your back. But if you just want to be popular... That's going to keep you out of the kingdom of God. That's a danger. You don't want popularity. You don't want everybody to like you. Now you don't have to go around making enemies. Enemies will come to you. You want to serve God. You want to live for God. You want to have high standards, morality. People will dislike you. Dislike you. James tells us in James 4, verse 4. James 4, verse 4 says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You want everybody to like you? You want to be a friend of the world? You'll become an enemy of God because you can't have both allegiances. So the danger of not entering the kingdom of God. Woe to those who are rich. Woe to those who frivolously laugh. And woe to those who seek and desire popularity. Now, here's where it really gets interesting. We're probably going to have to have another message on this because it's just the now you're a citizen of the kingdom now, right? You were poor, you hungered, and you wept. You became a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're paying the price for that citizenship. You have persecution. And you realize the danger of not becoming a citizen of the kingdom. Now for those citizen those citizens of the kingdom here, what is the supreme quality of a kingdom citizen? Luke 6, verse 27. Love. Love is the supreme quality. Now, this kind of love is nothing short of supernatural. This is not natural love. This is impossible love. <clears throat> this love cannot be obtained in your own strength. It's supernatural. Verse 27. Who can do this? But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Love your enemies. That's hard. Do good to those who hate you. Now you're really talking. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is revolutionary love. Verse 32. 
If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Everybody does that. For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Verse 35, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is supernatural love. I cannot in my own strength love this way. Amen. How could I love my enemies? What is the natural inclination? We hate our enemies. You kind of hate them. We don't do good to those who hate us. We hope bad things happen to them. We don't bless those who curse us. We curse them back. This is supernatural love. We cannot love this way. Being a citizen of the kingdom of God, we now have the power of the Holy Spirit of God in us who helps us to love this way. Who helps us to love this way. Being a Christian is a supernatural thing. Now, it gets even worse. Look at verse 29. What kind of love is this? It's supernatural and now it is non-retaliatory. We don't retaliate. We don't seek vengeance. We don't get even. I don't get mad, I just get even. No, we don't do that. Luke 6, 29. Who said it's going to be easy being a child of the kingdom? Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Give him the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Now we, we, we may have to go back and look at these because you don't want to misinterpret this. This is not speaking against self-defense or military preparedness for other nations. Uh, this is speaking about personal retaliation. Personal retaliation. Love is non-retaliatory. Don't be so ready to retaliate. It's a kind of love. It's non-retaliatory love. And then it's golden love. Ever heard of the golden rule? Look at verse 31. The golden rule. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Now, how, how do you want people to treat you? Well, you want to be treated good. Because you deserve it. I want you to treat me with respect and with consideration and all those things. So that's the way I like to be treated. I have to treat you the same way that I want to be treated. I want my wife to treat me a certain way. Well then I need to treat her the same way that I want her to treat me. That's what it says right there. It's the golden rule. It's golden love. Golden love. Because usually we want people to treat us like kings, but we're okay treating other people like dirt. No. You got to treat them like kings. Golden love. And then godlike love. Verse 35. You, when you love this way, you'll be sons of the Most High, for He Himself, think about it, God Himself is kind to you, ungrateful, and me, evil men. You and me, we're ungrateful and we're evil. But God is kind to us 
Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Godlike love. Now, if you are a citizen of the kingdom, this is how you live your life right here. It's not easy. It goes against the grain. But this is, we are called to live this way. So, we've been looking at kingdom living this morning. First of all, how do you get into the kingdom? Well, you've got to be poor in spirit. And you've got to weep and grieve over your condition. And you've got to hunger for righteousness. That's how you get into the kingdom. Now, once you're in the kingdom, you've got to be willing to pay the price for being in the kingdom. Persecution. Sometimes even from family. But the danger of not being in the kingdom is woe, woe, woe. Divine judgment. Now once you're in the kingdom, you've got to live like a child of the kingdom. You're not a child of darkness. Why are you living this way? A child of the kingdom loves supernatural, non-retaliatory, golden, godlike love. That's how we live in the kingdom. And with that, all of God's kingdom citizens, we will close in a word of prayer. We'll invite our ushers forward. We will thank God. I look around the room. I know most of you are in the kingdom. If you're not, you've got to get in that kingdom. Poor in spirit, remember. Poverty. Poverty. Our Father in heaven, you are the king of the kingdom. Most of us, Lord, are children of the kingdom. But sometimes we don't act like children of the kingdom. Help us, Lord. Give us that supernatural, revolutionary kingdom love. The kind of love that loves our enemies. That's non-retaliatory. The kind of love that will bring people to yourself as well. And now, Father, we pray that you would bless this morning's offering, for we committed to you in Jesus' name. Amen.